All right. Uh, welcome to the second day of the London Conference 2020. I'm Kate Spiliopoulos, Head of Events. Uh, as a reminder, if you'd like to tweet about today's session or follow the discussion online, please use the hashtag LONCONF20. That's L-O-N-C-O-N-F 20. If you're in the Zoom webinar this morning, you can submit questions for the panelists using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So if you hover your mouse over your screen, you'll see there's a Q&A function at the bottom right. Uh, and our chair today will be monitoring that during the Q&A section. We'll be kicking off in just a minute here. Um, but we wanted to talk about this morning the uh, big life-changing crisis that's uh, impacting people all over the globe. No, the other one. The other one, that is <laughs> climate change. Uh, we, we just feel like it's been such an insane year uh, and everybody realizes this is, is such an important problem, but there's very little room for it on the stage these days. So uh, we want to talk about how climate change is going to be interacting with plans to boost the economic recovery from COVID-19. And our chair for this session is Dr. Ashok Sinha. He's CEO of the London Cycling Campaign and chair of the London Sustainable Development Commission. So Ashok, welcome to the London Conference stage. Ashok, I, I think you're muted. Yeah, I thought you would mute me, unmute me automatically. Sorry about that, schoolboy error. Kate, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to participate in this morning's uh, session, which I'm really, really looking forward to, especially hearing from our esteemed panel, yes. As Kate said, uh, my name is Ashok Sinha. I'm the CEO of the London Cycling Campaign and Chair of the London Sustainable Development Commission. My job this morning is pretty easy. I'm just gonna try and choreograph uh, the conversation so that you can uh, get as much as you, you can out of our esteemed panelists who are uh, in order uh, on my screen, Catherine McGuinness. Catherine is Chair of the Policy and Resources Committee at City of London Corporation. You'll, and you'll see from the paperwork uh, that she has uh, an extensive career in financial services law and, uh, and has worked in financial services uh, uh, generally. And the City of London has held a number of portfolios, uh, not just in relation to financial services, but also in relation to education uh, and the arts. Uh, welcome, Catherine. Jamie, Jamie Hayward is also on the panel. Uh, he's Regional and General Manager North and, and Eastern Europe at Uber with uh, extensive experience in several continents. Uh, with a, a variety of uh, corporates, including Amazon, Virgin, and Orange. Orange. Uh, so welcome to you also, Jamie. And uh, Dimitri Zengelis, who is a fellow commissioner. Hi, Dimitri, nice to see you again. Uh, who is a, a special advisor for the Wealth Economy Project at the Bennett Institute at the University, uh, University of Cambridge. And uh, Dimitri, as I'm sure you all know, has enormous experience inside and outside of academia, including in government, playing a leading role in, in production of the Stern Report, which uh, many of us will still remember and still uh, refer to. Uh, a very um, a, a rich report that was full of foresight and insights that uh, are, are still relevant today. So welcome, Dimitri. Now, before I go on with a, a few words of introduction, I, I think we can get our poll up. There's a poll uh, which uh, Centre for London is running this morning uh, for this session. Uh, can we get it up? Right, here we go. Do you think the coronavirus crisis will ultimately be a step forward or a setback in terms of London achieving its climate goals. So if you could start voting in that poll and we'll come back to the answer in just a second. Now, um, this session is part of uh, Centre for London's 2020 annual conference and I can't think of a more important question to answer than how London and we as Londoners can play our part in the global effort to avert the uh, climate and ecological emergencies which threaten the very existence of civilization as we know and understand it. So it's a big picture question we're talking about here today. There's a sub question in all of that, which is if and how um, the economic recovery that we need to create, that we need to institute to help repair the damage that has been wrought by uh, dealing with the pandemic, if and how that can be used to take London inexorably and rapidly towards a radical reconfiguration of, of our economy so that it is zero carbon, it is zero waste, and, and we can, and doing so 
we can uh, create a fairer uh, and in doing so we can create a fairer and more equitable and more socially just and more prosperous and happier city along the way so let's go to the result of that poll what do people think can we get that up on the screen a step forward overwhelmingly some people think it's about 13 percent think it will hold us back and 15 percent uh think that it uh, won't have any particular bearing okay can we get take that off the screen now and ask the same question to our panelists and i'm going to start with Catherine, because Catherine, um, I know you have to go shortly before 11. So I'm going to start a lot of questions with you, if that's OK, while we still have you. Catherine, what, what was your answer to that question? Yeah, well, thank you very much. First of all, apologies that I do have to head off. That was a very positive result, I think, from your poll. And it's certainly the result I would like to see. We hear the mantra build back better all the time as we look at the recovery from this uh, uh, pandemic. Um, and I hope that this absolutely will be a catalyst, will be an opportunity for us to build on the changes that we've seen in the way people work. Uh, the way that, I, although I am expecting people to come back to the centre in numbers, I'm also expecting people to carry on using the new technologies that we've discovered or developed in order to work in a more hybrid manner, to spend more time working from home. I think that will be uh, one um, opportunity. I think uh, what we've done around uh, transport and ensuring that we have have um, more space in the streets, which maybe we've done partly because we need space for social distance, but certainly in the city, we had an ambitious transport strategy already aimed at uh, prioritising pedestrians and cyclists and active travel. We've accelerated that as a result of the pandemic. I think those are two examples of uh, in, uh, initiatives which we can build on to ensure that as we, uh, as we look to come back from this um, uh, pandemic, uh, we can uh, 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 you know, address this huge climate challenge as well. I have to say, though, I don't think it's completely a given. Uh, everybody is saying we must build back better, we must look, and as we look to economic recovery, and I would completely endorse this, we must look at those growth areas in our economy, such as developing green technology, uh, such as green finance, which is a big uh, specialism here in the city. Uh, but when I look at what people are actually doing in their daily lives, um, I, although, uh, although everybody's saying we must take advantage of this to, to, to address the climate challenge, I still see people wanting to use their cars. I still see, uh, you know, a, 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 I also worry about the amount of money that we're going to need to address the climate challenge and whether uh, the economic cost of this uh, uh, um, pandemic is going to get in the way. So very keen to see what we can do to build back better to ensure that we address the climate challenge at the same time. Worried about some of the challenges we'll face as we do that. Mm, I think that that's very wise to, to add a note of caution there, Catherine. Um, one of the things that really concerns me is that um, with the level of uh, economic disruption and possible unemployment and business closures, there'll be a mass rush for unsustainable consumption. And you pointed out that what's happening with motor vehicles, they're, they've gone back to higher levels of traffic in some parts of outer London, which is a segue to you, Jamie. Uh, what do you think? What was your answer to this question? Uh, so I, I, I shared the, the collective group's optimism. Um, so, you know, I, I felt actually, as we've all hunkered down in the first lockdown and as we're due to hunker down in the second lockdown, many people have, have sort of gone back to first principles about what's important to them and what's important to their family. Um, and, you know, I think the clean air and the bright skies of the first lockdown did cause people to think that, you know, actually climate change is just one of those fundamentals we need to get right. And if we don't get right, then, um, you know, we will all suffer the consequences for generations. I, I do also share Catherine's sort of uh, concern that actually, you know, the transition will be significant and the transition will be costly. And so whilst we're optimistic, I think we need to be sort of open-eyed and pragmatic uh, about how we fund that difference and make sure that it, it falls fairly on uh, everyone's shoulders and not disproportionately on the shoulders of just uh, those who are poorer in society. Mm, that's a really good point about uh, finance. And actually, the LSDC has done uh, a lot of work on this, and we'll maybe come back to, to that later on in, in the conversation. Dimitri, uh, what's the economist's view, your uh, view as an economist on this question? Well, thanks for asking, um, Ashok. And, and my answer is probably going to be very typical of an economist. So I, you know, I, I have sleepless nights and sort of dyspeptic ruminations about the fact that, you know, all this kind of 
positive things might come to nothing uh, as, as memories are short and everybody goes back to the bad old ways as uh, um, you know, the world um, gets over the pandemic and, and some of the benefits of some of the behavior changes and technological changes we see prove to be transitory. Um, on the other hand, you know, some would argue that we've seen six months of innovation, uh, so six years of innovation in behaviors and technologies in you know, as little as, uh, uh, as, as, as six weeks as a result of some of the changes we've seen here, you know, the use of connected technologies, meetings such as this one, um, better use of urban space, reclaiming streets, increased localization, more efficient use of supply lines and so on. Um, and my economist answer is I, I both worry about it and I'm optimistic. I actually voted uh, that it will be a step forward in this. Now, at first, that might seem, you know, typical of an economist, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, and, you know, however many hands economists are purported to have. Um, but actually, I think I probably share that sort of schizophrenia with a lot of the audience. Um, and I think Paul Romer, who is a Nobel Prize winning economist from last year, I think encapsulated it very well. When he's asked to comment on climate change and whether he's optimistic, he says the following. He says he's conditionally optimistic. What does that mean? Well, he, he, he um, contrasts conditional optimism with complacent optimism. Complacent optimism is the optimism you have when you just sit and expect the new technologies and the new behaviors and the new institutions to just sort of drop out from, you know, from the skies, manna from heaven, and you don't have to do anything and the climate problem is solved. Conditional optimism is one that says, look, we can see the technologies and the behaviors and institutions we need to bring this about. We can see some of the opportunities uh, from this. I mean, hands up who don't want, you know, cleaner, quieter, safer, more innovative, more productive, more efficient cities. Um, but we have to build it ourselves. The optimism is conditional on, on us taking action now, setting up the policy frameworks, uh, investing in the innovation, investing in the infrastructure, the skills, the technologies, and so on, to bring about that world. And if we do that, then we can do this quite easily. And, and that almost sort of, you know, belies the tragedy of this. It is within our grasp. We can do it. We can do it with great opportunities. But if we miss that opportunity, we go back to the bad old ways, we repeat our recovery plans, uh, the mistakes that we undertook, following the great financial crash of 2008, then the cost will be very high, not only in terms of the climate impact, uh, the lack of inclusivity and sustainability of our cities, the lack of livability, but also the opportunity that was so close within our graphs that we, um, that we actually managed to miss. Hmm, okay. So uh, can I take that, something you, you touched on some specifics about what a green recovery might look like, Dimitri. Uh, and so did you, Catherine and, and Jamie. Can I ask you to paint uh, a, a bit more of a specific picture of what uh, would be a good and green recovery? So it could be in relation to transport, it could be in relation to housing, business, uh, jobs, skills, education, green spaces. Uh, what would a good recovery be? And I don't mean what's the end point in 2050, or some of us believe, you know, we need to decarbonize and, and circulate even sooner than that. But let's just say over the next five years, if you're explaining to the eight or nine million Londoners that live in our great city, what would it look like? How would their life be different? Catherine, would you oh, like to go first? Yes, thanks very much. First of all, I, I, Dimitri, I think is absolutely right. We shouldn't underestimate the economic challenge here. And it's absolutely essential that as we look at recovery, we ensure that green and growth go hand in hand because this climate challenge is so uh, uh, enormous. I'm going to pick three elements. I'm going to pick, pick buildings, um, transport, and then skills. There's much, you know, a lot more that we, we could talk about. Buildings, I think we're going to need a real focus on our buildings at retrofitting existing buildings to make sure that they are more climate uh, resilient so that we are moving towards net zero, uh, also so that we're moving towards net zero uh, targets. Um, so buildings in the first place, and I'll come back to that, that's a major issue in itself because I'm told that 70% of London's housing stock, for example, needs retrofitting. So that's a pretty big challenge. Um, a transport where I do think we need to be looking at more active um, methods and we really need to be ensuring that our infrastructure is uh, set up for that. And indeed that we're encouraging people to use more 
efficient um, uh, uh, where they are driving or whatever, use more efficient um, uh, machines. And I think thirdly, we need the skills that will support all of this. I've just come actually from a session with some of the uh, uh, London, uh, inner London leaders talking about the skills that we need to develop for the future, whether as we're looking at construction skills, we need to develop some new skills in order to meet the green challenge. You know, as we're looking at banking skills, do we need to look at uh, new skills in, 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 in uh, the green space? Um, so I, I think there's a whole raft of things that we need to do. For ourselves in the City of London, we're very focused on this. We've just adopted a climate action strategy, which will see us um, uh, net zero in our own activities by 2027, but across our whole value chain by 2040. And uh, we're really committed to working with partners, and that, those partners include the businesses within the city, to ensure that the square mile itself uh, is addressing some of these challenges, is looking at uh, how buildings um, are um, um, uh, operated how buildings are built uh, to make sure that uh, you know, uh, uh, they are more climate efficient, they're more resilient. Um, and uh, uh, we're also working with the Green Finance Institute to look at methods of, of, of meeting some of these huge finance challenges that we'll face in, uh, in the retrofitting and, and uh, also in taking things forward. Mm, thank you, Catherine. Yes, certainly retrofitting London's housing stock to, uh, to make it zero carbon, zero energy is a gargantuan task. Uh, Jamie, Dimitri, who wants to pick this one up next? Jamie, right. you're okay to do so? Yeah, absolutely. So from, I mean, to zoom in on one of the areas that Catherine touched on, which is sort of dear to my heart, which is uh, transport. Um, from Uber's perspective, a green recovery would be uh, transport that is more active, more shared, uh, and more electric. So in London, I think if I focus in on the electric part, we're, we're lucky enough that actually with the CCZ and ULEZ, TfL's already put in place quite a strong policy foundation to uh, incentivize drivers to move to zero emission vehicles uh, with a view to try and reduce congestion and emissions. Now, in response to that, in 2019, we, we launched our clean air plan and we made a commitment. So this is you know, two years before COVID, um, but it shows how, how long some of these time horizons are. Uh, and we committed that all 45,000 vehicles on the Uber app in London would be fully electric by 2025. Um, and since then, you know, we've raised more than 100 million pounds to support drivers switching into an electric vehicle and more than 1.5 million trips have been taken uh, on Uber in London uh, in electric vehicles. Uh, so we're making progress. Um, and in addition, what we've done this year is we've, to try and support drivers in that transition, we've uh, announced industry partnerships with Nissan to help drivers move to more affordable vehicles and with BP to pro provide drivers with new dedicated charging points in London. And the benefit of all this effort over the last two years has meant that um, actually we're getting to the stage now uh, and where we can launch an Uber Green product uh, in London in 2021, uh, where there'll be a sufficient number of electric vehicles uh, on the Uber app in London, such that actually riders can request a zero emission vehicle in London um, and a number of other European cities, um, and therefore sort of drive the choice and drive the demand and drive the transition uh, for a cleaner, more electric uh, transport system. Mm. Okay something that's very, very dear to my own heart in, in the day job. Dimitri, um, rather than ask, answer the same question that Catherine and, and Jamie, uh, uh, I, that I posed to them, I know Catherine has to go. I want to pick up the issue of financing and how we finance the transition to a, uh, a green economy and a fair and inclusive economy. And Dimitri, if you wanted to just refer to some of the work we've done at the LSDC on the London uh, Future Finance Facility, that would be great. I'm also seeing some questions in the chat. People are saying there are trade-offs. Um, we can't afford to pay for uh, dealing with every single challenge that society is facing right now. Um, equally, some people, some economists, or you may be one of Dimitri, say actually it's, there aren't trade-offs. It's about reorientating towards sustainable uh, finance, which will inherently bring, bring with it uh, an increase in, in the, in the um, common wheel. Anyway, so how do we pay for all of this? And what do you think the trade-offs are, Dimitri? Thanks, Ashok. Um, well, look, well, it's going to require 
some um, uh, public sector investment for sure. Um, this is a very good time for it. Um, the IMF, the IMF, <laughs> I emphasize this, not just um, some of the work that, that we have done where we've been talking about this, but the IMF in its latest fiscal report says that for most rich countries, investing in um, some of the sectors that we've talked about in terms of, you know, things like clean R&D spending, clean infrastructure, uh, clean energy infrastructure, buildings, upgrades, and the rest, um, mean that every dollar that the government borrows uh, in rich economies such as the UK generates close to three dollars in extra output. They call that a multiplier. They, they come up with a multiplier of 2.7, um, which means that it more than pays for itself. And we would be absolutely foolish if we were not uh, increasing public sector debt to GDP right now in order to generate investment in those assets that will bring returns that allow you to bring debt to GDP down uh, by uh, 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 inflating the denominator in that ratio, GDP. And that's the only way public sector debt to GDP has ever sustainably been brought down. We, we realize the mistake of trying to fixate on the numerator, debt, by pushing austerity too soon. That's what we did following the financial crash of 2008, the result of which is we have low productivity growth across the rich world has languished. And we'd have to focus on monetary policy because real interest rates have fallen close to zero because there's more saving than there is uh, absorbed by investment. And that's caused all sorts of headaches for monetary policy, which I will not bore this audience with. So there's gonna have to be some dire public investment in some of those areas I just mentioned, but you will also, this is about more than investment. It's about the policies, setting the incentives and the signals, things like pricing, standards, regulations, uh, and supporting uh, R&D and deployment. And it's also about the institutional architecture. And this is where things like the uh, London um, uh, Clean Finance, uh, Future Finance Facility comes in, uh, together with our efforts to um, bring about a new uh, national uh, investment bank and our efforts to push for increased localism, devolution, pushing on the Local Government Devolution Act of 2016, um, so that policy can actually um, help reduce risks in sectors that are hugely policy driven. I mean, we're talking here about buildings, we're talking about transport, we're talking about energy, right? These are very strongly regulated policy driven sectors. So if the private sector feels that the risks, the policy risks that it doesn't own, uh, and the complexity of these sectors are such that uh, the risks are too high, uh, they won't invest or they will demand a very high risk premium to invest in those sectors. And that's where the Future Finance Facility and the National Investment Bank can help managing these more complex regions, uh, so these more complex uh, projects, and by helping to uh, reduce um, the risk premium associated with that by taking on policy risks and showing confidence in government policy that it actually has skin in the game in its own, um, in its own policies. And, and also by taking a more sort of long-term view than the private sector might take in some of these network infrastructure areas. So the idea here is not that the public sector is going to be this, but there are small things the public sector can do through policy, through institutions, and through a little bit of investment that will leverage substantial sums of private investment because the private sector sees the opportunity here. It wants to move in. It just wants a clear and credible right. signal from government in order to do so. Super. I I'm conscious that Catherine needs to go. Catherine, can I ask the question in simple terms? Because I'm very proud of myself. I followed what you said, Dimitri, but it was quite complicated. Um, in simple terms, I look at the City of London and think there's an enormous amount of private wealth in the City of London. I look at uh, Westminster and Whitehall and say, our, our, I look at it and think our finances uh, we're really cash strapped as a as a public as a public sector's cash strap. So how do we get that enormous amount of wealth that exists in the city and the pension funds elsewhere flowing into retrofitting those seventy the seventy percent of houses in London that need to be retrofitted, flowing into digital infrastructure so that people can uh, work more from home, decarbonising transport. How do, how do we get it moving? Well, I think the very good news is that there's a huge investor demand for investing in uh, green projects and for financing transition. Um, An investor demand uh, which is driven by two things. First of all, the increasing expectations, particularly from younger investors, uh, that they should see ESG, uh, environmental, uh, social and, and good governance returns from their, from their money. They want to invest with purpose. And I think that's a really positive development that is absolutely shooting up the agenda. But I think also a recognition that actually some of these risks 
risks are risks which the private sector uh, needs to invest in to meet in order for long-term gain. As I think Dimitri has said, some of these challenges and some of this, these questions of resilience are really critical to you know, long-term sustainability of business. So there is a huge uh, um, uh, demand to uh, invest uh, in this area, uh, which I think uh, with the right incentives uh, from, from public um, uh, uh, involvement too, we can see we can we can start to see unlocked. Um, actually, in, in our own what those incentives would be. Sorry, what's Could ask what those incentives would be? The, well, the incentives, because I understand the demand is there, but it's not flowing. So what's well, some the of it is, what some, of, some, of, some of it is, I think, actually, Ashford. Okay. If you look at the increasing okay. amounts of funds which okay. are flowing into projects which have got an ESG element, and actually over this last period, they have made more. Uh, they, they, people have been making more through those investments than they have, um, uh, okay. you know, in, in some of the others. So I think there is a big uh, incentive there. But it is absolutely true. We need to keep focused on the need, the imperative here, and we need to look at standard setting. We need to look at what requirements people should have when they're making a loan. What should they expect uh, um, the uh, company they've invested in or lent to, uh, to, to do uh, so that um, you know, we avoid uh, just putting something into something which has got a nice green label on it. We need to be absolutely sure that we are putting money where it matters and avoiding greenwashing. And actually, that's another area where I think um, the huge assets of the City of London can help because we, are, you know, we have a sort of expertise around um, uh, regulation. I think we, we can be a useful voice in helping to set standards uh, in this space. Indeed, City Corporation has been involved in uh, looking at some green standards for investment in infrastructure projects. Uh, my connection is unstable, apart from the fact I'm going to be leaving in a second. I just want to make two final points very quickly, if I could just take the opportunity. And the first is that you talked about trade-offs. And yes, there will be big trade-offs. One of those, um, one trade-off, uh, I would say, is that uh, one of the reasons London thrives um, as a global financial centre is its global connectivity. And I'm afraid that doesn't just mean this, it also means the ability to travel. So we're not going to see an end to air travel, uh, but we need, to, so, so that I think is going to be an issue where we need to look at how that can be more sustainable while you know, retaining the business travel, the tourist travel and so on, uh, that parts of our economy really depend on. So that's one point I wanted to make. But then finally, I wanted to say, we have a huge asset here in London, which I think is underused. It was used for centuries, and it's gone into disuse, and that is our river, the Thames. And mm, I think the Thames agreed. will be a fantastic resource if we use it better for, um, you know, for, for moving goods around the place, as well as for passenger transport, and a great way to use distribution centres and bring things in, which we can distribute through last mile deliveries or whatever. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to a number of people about this. It would be great to see uh, much more done about uh, uh, you know reusing reusing uh, that fantastic resource so i'm really sorry at that point to press the eject button and shoot yeah, off to yeah. my next event but thank you very much everybody so sorry to, to lose you but thank you for joining us thank this you morning, Catherine. thanks very much everyone bye Catherine. okay let's uh, jamie i'm going to uh, go to you again because there are a couple of questions in the in the, in the chat which are sorry in the uh, q a which i think are, are very pertinent to your area of cool. work, but in answering, uh, in answering, uh, could you also just, like Catherine did, just give, give us your take on what some of the trade-offs are, what some of the obstacles to achieving this green economy, circular decarbonize, where will we have to con concede some ground or do things differently, uh, go outside of our comfort zone sometimes? Um, and so, there's a couple of things in the in the uh, uh, in the Q and A. I'm going to paraphrase one of the questions: the 15-minute city. We've heard. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hidalgo in Paris talk about the 15 minute city, bringing destinations and uh, origins closer together. And of course, that transport plays an important role in this. So, how do we, is, it, is the 15 minute city a good idea? Does it help us get towards a, a greener economy? Uh, and, and also, um, there's some uh, a question that's directed uh, you and Uber. It says, uh, isn't, there, isn't there evidence that Uber has been responsible for a significant propor proportion of the growth in traffic in London? Uh, and if so, how does that square with your climate optimism? I, I hear your point about electric vehicles, but at the same time, vehicles are vehicles, and there are all sorts of other uh, yeah. problems that come with having too many vehicles in London streets. So what do you think, Jamie? Yeah, okay, so let me, there's, there's sort of three, three questions there. One is around uh, the challenges, um, and I'll build on Dimitri's point on the investment required um, to to help transportation go green. The second one is around the 15 minute city 
and the third one is around Uber's role in uh, sort of uh, congestion and, and emissions. So if I deal with the first one, um, I mean, from, from our perspective, the big area where we need, we see a great need for investment to support um, sustainable infrastructure, transport infrastructure is in the area of EV charging, electric vehicle charging. So what we're seeing is that actually, you know, EV, the vehicles are getting cheaper by around five to 10% a year. We're also seeing that larger and larger batteries are coming online, which means that now uh, drivers can do a full day's uh, full day's work on a single charge. But the, the reason why drivers are telling us that they're not yet upgrading to EVs is because of EV charging infrastructure. Now, to sort of there's, there's three parts to that. So one part is there just aren't enough chargers. So in Netherlands, there's 20 EV chargers for every 100 kilometers of road. In the UK, there's three. Um, the second one is the chargers from a London perspective are all are in the wrong places. So, um, you know, when we look at where the charges are in London, there's uh, roughly five to six times more charges in Westminster than there are in places like Newham or Redbridge or Tower Hamlets. And yet those are the areas where professional drivers live and professional drivers are we believe going to be the mass early adopters for electric vehicles because uh, the economics of an electric vehicle are you pay slightly more up front but you get lower running cost so if actually actually it makes sense first for professional drivers who drive more per day um, and then the third issue uh, that we see with uh, electric charging infrastructure is uh, they're the wrong types of chargers so actually the best type of chargers for both the grid and the driver and the car is overnight charging. Um, and yet in many of the areas of London, you know, people don't have access to uh, on, on off street parking. And so they're reliable, they're, re they're reliant on sort of public parking and public charges, and there just aren't enough of them. So this is one of the reasons why, you know, we're stepping into this space to try and, and committing to invest 5 million pounds in electric charging infrastructure in London by 2023. But that's a tiny drop in the ocean compared to what is required. And I think when we when we look at the kind of policy action, which Catherine was talking about, um, and which Dimitri were talking about, I think that's how we unlock the real value. And if we look at, say, let's take City of Amsterdam, which has got you know, seven times more charges per kilometer of road than we do in the UK. What have they done there? Uh, and it builds on many of the things that Dimitri was saying. Firstly, they've got a very big, bold commitment. So they've said every individual living in Amsterdam has a right to plug. So effectively, the, the, the city and the government will build infrastructure within a predefined period of time near your home when you request it. Um, secondly, they're setting strategy for infrastructure at the city-wide level. So they, they develop a, a city-wide plan and they implement this, the, this, the, the plan there, as opposed to a, a very sort of devolved plan that's happening borough by borough or, you know, with individual uh, councils making individual decisions. Um, and thirdly, they have uh, much better and much more open data sharing. So you can go on to the uh, the city of Amsterdam website, and you can get enormous amounts of data of how many of the EVs there are, where they are, how many charges they are, what the utilization is, what the pricing is. And that creates an environment where the private sector can, can lean in at both the retail and the wholesale level and say, actually, look, there is, you know, there's reliable investment and there's reliable revenues we can get, we can fund okay. it. And I think, I think the same would be true uh, in London. So, Jamie, that's re that's really useful, but I think we might be going a little too deep into the detail uh, sure. at, at that point. I'm just, it, it, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying, but can I just bring it up a second to what you said about policy? Yeah, the policy drivers. So, the, the weird London cycling campaign. We we produced a report earlier this year to form the basis of our election campaign next year. It's called Climate Safe Streets, and it is essentially positing the idea that we can decarbonize London's roads by yep. 2030. Mass expansion of the cycling network, better uh, zero car and more plentiful public transport, uh, smart road user charging, 
and the provision of smart mobility solutions and the, as an alternative to a private motor vehicle. So we're imagining a city in which most people most of the time come 2030 will not need to have a private motor car. In fact, 50% of Londoners already Londoners don't have access to a motor yeah. car. Is that the kind of policy goal that we could and should be setting for our city? I would say yes, you may disagree. If so, do we have the gumption to try and put into place the policy tools necessary to get to that destination? And can we bring the, pol the public with us? And Jamie, Dimitri, uh, either of you on, on that point. So I, from a, so I completely agree that the goal should be no private car ownership. I think private cars are uh, not the best way of helping cities get around. You know, it's crazy that the second most expensive asset sits empty for 95% of the time, taking up space in London. Um, you know, so we completely share your, your view of um, shared electric uh, and more active uh, transportation. And the thing that we're doing is therefore, there's both a mode question, which is how do we enable riders and passengers to make better choices? You know, so we've launched Uber Boat, trying to take advantage of the river, which Catherine mentioned. We've got jump bikes to try and give people more active options. We've also got pool and access to public transit. Giving riders, giving passengers that choice, I think is a good thing. But at the same time, we need to make sure that the polluting parts of the transportation infrastructure are electrified. So it's a it's a both rather than neither. Of course, of course. Of course. Dimitri, can I can I uh, ask you a question now? Uh, let's move away from transport. I know it's it's it's, it's such a uh, totemic issue. Transportation. It's something that we, we we all use transport. It's there. We see it in the streets. Maybe we'll come back to it. Uh, before I, actually, I go to you, Dimitri, I am aware that there are a lot of questions in the Q&A, and I'm sorry to, to those of you who, whose question uh, I'm not able to pose. There are just too many, but I'll try and gather them together into general themes and pose them. Dimitri, can I look at the social side of things? Uh, um, we, London has some of the world's, uh, sorry, some of England's most impoverished communities. We have wealth disparities uh, that are enormous, uh, greater than almost anywhere else in England. Um, we could achieve a green a recovery and still have impoverishment and disadvantage uh, and uh, a lack in the sum total of social justice. What do we have to do to make sure that we achieve a green recovery that is genuinely for all Londoners and reduce some of those, uh, some of that unfairness and, and inequality? Yeah, okay. I mean, at some point, I'd love to come back to the transport question and the 15 minutes. Oh, please do. Please, yeah, some please. of the risks. Well, I, I, why don't I wrap it into this question as well, actually, uh, in a way that I think frames uh, the answer in terms of sustainability, inclusivity, and resilience in general, because there are some real risks to the compact connected city as a result yeah. of our response to the. Any of the responses, the behavior response, have been very favorable. For sustainability, but some uh, associated with the kind of need for greater sort of spatial uh, separation, which is the enemy of agglomeration. Uh, and agglomeration is both the friend of innovation and wealth, but it's also uh, the friend of sustainability. And agglomeration is when people uh, live in compact connected cities and do things more efficiently and more innovatively. Um, and the risk, well, I mean, I, I'm starting to answer it now, aren't I? I mean, the risk there is kind of pretty, pretty obvious, and we're seeing it already. You know, there, there is a risk that people are moving increasingly from uh, public transport to cars, seeking to live uh, more in the suburbs with more green space. Um, and, and if this trend continues, you, you run the risk of um, greater urban sprawl and the hollowing out of our cities. Uh, which is something we don't want. And I think there's a sort of, there's a sting in the tail here where, you know, as a result of this, and we're seeing this already, of course, people tend to use public transport less, public transport revenues fall. Um, the wrong policy response to that is to say, well, if revenues are full, we need to postpone modernization, postpone investment and capacity. Because of course, all that does is it makes public transport even less reliable and attractive. So even fewer people use it. And you can very quickly get a death spiral of public transport. We've seen that already, uh, for example, in the shelving Crossrail 2 and other uh, plans for London's public transport infrastructure. It's very, very dangerous if we start undoing the benefits of a compact connected city, because therein lies the greatest hope of not only building interactive, livable uh, 
cities that appeal to people of high wage and high skills, uh, but also um, suburbs are just less efficient in terms of their resource and energy use. And we really don't want to start moving towards the American model of urbanization, which is substantially uh, less efficient and substantially less compatible with sustainability. Now, on your point on uh, equality, I mean, the, you know, the, it's really, I mean, the, the way forward here to build on um, the investment we need for the 21st century for a city like London is to think about what is London going to need to be competitive uh, in the 21st century uh, in an environment that's going to be resource constrained and carbon constrained. And now, obviously, that means investing in the right kind of infrastructure and not uh, you spending public and private money propping up things like fossil fuel intensive infrastructure uh, that we're going to be locked into for decades and have to retrofit. It means investing in human capital. This is important. Um, it means uh, providing the skills and jobs necessary for the first 21st century, retooling and reskilling workers, not just for the low carbon economy, but for this sort of gamut of uh, technologies that are coming our way from things like AI and the internet of things and big data and digitization, all the rest of it, which really threatened to change radically the way that we work and live. And if workers aren't prepared for that and they can't participate and benefit from that change, that's going to uh, increase inequality because it's the most vulnerable who tend to suffer. Natural capital is a classic example. We've seen during this pandemic um, a division between those with gardens and access to green space and the benefits that has not only um, to their physical health, but also to their mental health versus those who tend to be crowded in communities far from green space who have suffered much more um, from uh, the pandemic. And an investment in natural capital has so many benefits in terms of uh, not just health, but also uh, retaining water, uh, absorbing pollution, uh, cooling down the heat island, and so on, that we're really valuing and investing in it much more. And then finally, your point about tackling inequalities. It's not just inequalities in income. It's not just inequalities in wealth. It's inequalities in access to public goods and services, things such as health, things such as housing, things such as transport, education and justice, which are not equally distributed. And again, I think, you know, if we if the pandemic results in a division of responses whereby the wealthy can actually move homes to areas that are greener, uh, that are well connected, um, leaving the rest of us to sort of struggle in a hollowed out city with poor infrastructure, poor connections and a lack of investment in green space, that's only going to do damage to the livability and, prospect, uh, and prosperity of a city like London. And we really need to think carefully about how we avoid that. That's a that's a, a really important point. And can I just push you on to that a bit more? And Jamie, please do come in as well. Let's make it real. Um, near where I live, there's a housing estate where there are kids on that housing estate who probably, I, I know some of them, they don't have the kit at home uh, to, uh, to, to be able to learn, uh, learn very well at home. They've suffered quite a lot during this, this COVID-19 uh, crisis. They don't even have a quiet, quiet space to, to work. Um, you've got kids at university now who are struggling. I, it just feels to me right now, in this period of time, there's a generation of youngsters who are, who are already disadvantaged, who have become potentially even more disadvantaged, disadvantaged because of the rigors of lockdown and, and what's happening in our education system. Yet we need, as you were saying, to talk uh, about, we need to have people uh, uh, getting access to the jobs of the future, the skills of the future in the, in the green economy, the circular economy. Um, how do we how do we crack it so that those kids who are right at the brunt of it now don't become a lost generation and become the people who are driving forward a greener and, and, and fairer uh, economy and society and also just in terms of uh, the innovation we want an innovative city we can't afford to That's only right. be allowing innovation to to be cultivated in some sectors of our society and losing all that potential for innovation in other sectors of our society because they don't have the support networks uh, and uh, and the other uh, the other wherewithal that is necessary to give them a chance to be innovative and creative. Mm. And no. we're at the crux of something. How do we make sure we exit it effectively? Can I can I go on the, the... please, Jack? Yeah. So I. I... I think Dimitri is absolutely right that, you know, one of the great aspects of London and, and all big cities is the agglomeration effect means that, you know, individuals come together, connect with each other in sometimes planned, sometimes random ways. And out of that comes innovation and new thinking and the combination of ideas. Uh, and that, that I think is what has made 
London great and, and what we have to make sure we keep as we sort of look into the future and so a, a suburban sprawl would be a really uh, bad answer because I think you you'd have fewer connections and our sort of London's collective brain uh, would therefore shrink. I think that the, the interesting question for me is then you overlay the way that London's transport infrastructure has sort of built since Victorian times and it's very hub and spoke so you've got You've got a model where you know people come in for or historically have come in for fixed periods of time into the center of the city sat at desks sometimes sometimes interacting with with their peers sometimes not and then uh, being pulled out again at the end of the day and i think you know a a world i think it is possible to make but i think we do need to be cautious to make things more local while still keeping the power of sort of connectivity and the innovation that comes from that connectivity and to make sure that communities, all communities are able to connect. Now, you know, but I do think that London's transport system, which has traditionally been very hub and spoke, will need to work out how it adapts to that change to facilitate it. And, you know, in times of change, flexibility and optionality are worth a lot. Um, and none of us really knows how COVID is going to make the city work in the future and how people are going to get around. But it, it does seem that actually, therefore, you know, what we want, what I think Uber, uh, the role that we can play in that is to try and give individuals a range of options as to how they get around, you know, bikes and walking for short trips, uh, public transport, Uber boat to use, use the river, and then to let them and let the signals of the, what they're choosing allow us to sort of redesign mass transport to make sure that it's working for the city. Um, but, you know, it does require a lot of thought uh, and quite a lot of flexibility. Oh, okay, I, so back to transport, I get, yeah, go ahead. Dimitri, please. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Sorry. I mean, you raised the, the issue of optionality here, and I, I think that is right. Of course, some big infrastructure investments require taking a punt about the future, and they do mean you lock into them, and it may be that by the time it's built, um, the infrastructure is redundant. It's entirely possible that Crossrail 2, if it's ever built, um, is built at a time when everybody's using autonomous vehicles and therefore perhaps requires it less. Um, I'm relaxed about that. I think, you know, you can't expect every single infrastructural project to hit the mark. If one or two aren't um, redundant, then you're probably under investing. And I think the evidence suggests that when it comes to infrastructure investment, in the UK in particular, perhaps less so in London, um, we've tended to under rather than over invest. So I'm not too worried that we're going to over invest in our transport infrastructure. The risks of being too cautious when it comes to optionality is that you end up with a city like Jakarta, um, where every, you know, every public transport project fails its cost benefit analysis because you haven't considered the network effect. We're lucky in London, we have a very good transport network. So the marginal uh, value of every additional uh, tube line is a lot higher than if you just had one tube line because you link into this powerful network and you avoid having the kinds of problems that cities that didn't head and do that because they didn't think about the network externalities associated with big infrastructure projects. So, so I think, I, you know, I think Jamie's right. I mean, it's got to be a question of balance and keeping options open, but part of keeping options open is that you have uh, an infrastructure plan that you continue to press on with until such time as it's very clear yes. um, that it will be redundant. I think I we're far from that. Point, right. Yeah, I mean, my point wasn't optionality as a hedge. My point was, yeah actually the signals of how people are changing their their patterns and the data we can get from that drive future Absolutely. decisions. Otherwise what we're left with is people will be on, on the corridors that they were on 10 years ago, even though the world has changed. Yeah, very good. And then we have the question of the Chairman, governance Chairman, of that. Is it the public authorities or is it private oh, companies? Okay. So there's all, but I think you're absolutely right. I think well, we're in agreement that has to be the way forward. Let's hold on the, the governance of the data question because that, that is an important one, but we, we, we won't have time. Uh, can I, uh, there's, there's, there's a question in the, in the Q&A, which I think is interesting. interesting. It's, an, it's an obvious one and one that people, I'm sure everybody uh, uh, watching will be asking themselves. Um, uh, I, think I can't find the question, but I'll, I'll pose it myself. Can we have, is a consumerist, I think the question was, is a consumerist society consistent with a green recovery. So we are all, I'm sure, very aware that if you look at direct emissions, carbon emissions, London's uh, uh, done reasonably well. We've seen a decline in direct emissions, but we have just offshored a heck of a lot of 
production of carbon uh, through the, uh, the goods and the products that we import from other parts of the world. And there's a high uh, carbon content in some of those goods and products. Now, we know the high streets under massive pressure. We've got retailers closing. We've got people in the hospitality industry uh, uh, on their last legs. Um, the pressure to open up, just watch what happens on, on Black Friday, potentially. The pressure to get this economy moving again through uh, accelerated and ultimately unsustainable non-green consumption is, is it potentially enormous. And it's a long-term issue. Is, is the way we consume compatible with a green recovery for London? Uh, the answer is no. I mean, the way we consume now. Okay. Uh, the, the way we consume now, no. And the way we could consume, yes. Uh, um, you know, we're not. Um, yeah, you know, we have. To be honest, we haven't really bothered trying to change our ways. We know that, for example, we can get emissions more or less down to net zero within a meaningful time frame, with very little impact on growth and with substantial benefits and opportunities. Um, we just haven't bothered trying. In the sectors we have bothered trying, things like renewable energy and uh, vehicles, we know that we're going to have cheaper, better uh, energy and vehicles, irrespective of whether we give two hoots about the climate, because we've bothered to innovate in technologies uh, which actually end up being lower cost uh, and more productive and efficient. They require investment to get you there, but we're going to have better cars, cheaper electricity. That's brilliant. Um, there are many other sectors where if we make the effort, we can start squaring the circle both of dematerialization, um, and this would require investment in the circular economy and reuse and reducing waste and so on, and at the same time improve efficiency and productivity because waste is, well, how can I put it? It's wasteful. Um, you know, inefficiency is, well, how can I put it? Inefficient. Um, all these things limit productivity and actually limit uh, growth and, uh, and therefore prosperity. So um, yes, I think we can do it. Yes, I think we can have much more sustainable lifestyles without necessarily taking a knock on consumption by changing the way we do things, changing the way we produce, uh, increasing the, the weightless economy and dematerialization uh, and focusing on services which don't have quite such a high uh, resource goal. We don't need five cars and six watches, but we might want to uh, spend more time with family and going to the theatre and uh, enjoying some services which are much more efficient in their use of resources. So, um, you know, I, I think it's too soon to say we can't do this until we actually made a kind of conscious and purposeful effort to try and do that. If, we if that doesn't work, then fine, let's consider degrowth and reduction in consumption. But at least in the interim, let's try and change the way um, we manage our economy to make it more sustainable. I, I would agree. I mean, two, two, things, two things I would draw out is, is firstly, uh, the shared economy and the efficiencies, if actually we're sharing certain common assets better and using them better. So again, the, the obvious example that I think we all agree on is the private car sits empty for 95% of the time. That is just a waste of material and resources and energy. I think the second thing I, I'd say is, um, I think it, it's still important that uh, choice you, you know whilst we whilst we could be skepti skeptical of consumerism with all of the sort of waste that it implies i think choice is is still going to be an important driver of a of that better world so i think but i think it needs to be an informed choice where we are making available to people all the information about how the decisions that they take uh, pollute uh, or cause other members of the community in which they live some kind of you know, collective, uh, collective pain. And, and I think that side of it, in other words, the way we use data to allow people to choose things that are informed choices, not just informed by what they individually want, but actually the impact on the broader collective, I think uh, is, is important and, and something that I don't think we do very well now. So if I take the example, sorry to go back to transport again, you know, the, the data on transport and the emissions for different ways of getting from the suburbs into London is really poor. I don't know that people really understand the difference, the difference in emissions and congestion impact for all of those different choices that they're making. And, and I think we would be better if we made it more transparent. We had better ways of, of allowing people to factor that into their decisions. Hmm. I 100% agree with that. Uh, um, and I do hear your, the points you're making yeah. in relation to informed choice, but we are in an emergency. 
and we need to go much faster and, and slash uh, carbon emissions more deeply uh, than ever before. So what about things like uh, a carbon border tax? Would we be prepared as a country to put a, pr uh, a, car uh, a price a premium on goods that are coming into this country that have a high embedded carbon content and would the population put up with it and would this actually be a driver towards more innovation and a stimulus to 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 reward the the, the companies that are looking at their value chains and are trying to dematerialize and decarbonize their value chains uh, maybe this is a question for an economist uh, ah. dimitri as well as information and as well as incentives yeah. Do we need a bigger stick? Yeah, why not? And so look, if, but you need, you need the stick to be matched by the carrots, right? So if you set up a policy framework with the right institutions of the kind we've spoken about already, the right policies, so uh, effective carbon pricing, the UK doesn't do too bad on that, uh, standards and regulations, um, support for R&D and deployment. If at that point you then feel that, you know, you're making the effort and the, the playing field, the competitive playing field is not level, and actually, you've got to bear in mind that by doing this, you're going to make a heck of a lot of sectors much more competitive in the 21st century because uh, it's a kind of a one way bet. The world will become lower carbon and more resource constrained. So the, the faster you can build your economy uh, to steer a comparative advantage in those uh, sectors, uh, the better you'll do. But, yeah, there are carbon intensive sectors that you don't want to offshore. Uh, and a border tax adjustment is one way to perhaps um, address that. Now, it's a very fiddly thing to do because you have to look at the carbon content of every good at the border. Um, you know, we're building quite complex systems on our borders right now. So maybe the addition of a border tax adjustment won't be that onerous in terms mm. of administration. But it's something that needs careful thinking. There are ways around doing it. I won't bore you by talking about them now. But actually what's important in terms of the stick might be just the mere threat of a border tax adjustment. So you could say to a country, look, we don't think you're pulling your weight in reducing emissions. Uh, we're gonna give you five years to get your house in order and then we will consider the imposition of a border tax adjustment. And if you know the EU, America, the UK and the big economies all act together to do that, that's gonna be a powerful motivator for some of the major exporters. I won't name names, but we know who they might be. Um, and we've seen in the past that countries like China um, have actually anticipated those kinds of moves by um, taxing their exports on the basis of carbon. They used to tax their steel exports. They applied a carbon price uh, in order to try and make Chinese steel more carbon efficient. Now, that tells you something. The Chinese see advantage in making their sectors more competitive in the kinds of areas that will drive growth in the future. And that means them being more resource efficient and lower carbon. So I think the mix of carrot and sticks is something that could work quite well in the context of countries understanding the opportunities from the low carbon economy, as well as the threat to their high carbon sectors. Hmm. Okay, I wasn't aware of that, uh, uh, the, the action that the Chinese were taking in relation to that. That's, that's really yeah, yeah, yeah. really interesting. Yeah, I and I think it should be more... We, this should, this yeah. should be more widely known. Uh, thank you for telling us. We only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to ask a, a very broad brush, broad brush question. Imagine you are standing, you are standing in next year's mayoral election, and imagine you get elected. What would you seek to do over your four-year term of office to use the situation that we're in now, the pandemic, to construct a pathway towards uh, a green uh, economy, a green and just economy for London. Who wants to take that one first? Um, I'll have a crack. Go, go on, Dimitri. <laughs> well, I, you know, I was just going to say expectations, expectations, expectations. I mean, it's all about credibility. You need to have a clear vision of where you want to go that's convincing and compelling enough to steer investors. And that means doing everything you can with the limited policy levers that a mayor has uh, but also lobbying and advocating very clearly and working with businesses to talk about what are the policy frameworks and institutions necessary to drive that kind of investment. And if that's clear and it's coherent, um, I think that could make a very, very big difference in contrast to getting mixed and muddled signals or being too cautious or, um, you know, not wondering whether there'll be growth effects in this sector and that sector and, and you know, uh, a, a much more kind of disaggregated and dispersed approach to this story. It can't be about... Uh, a community heating scheme there and a green roof here. It's got to be about a vision of a green competitive London that steals the march on other metropolitan uh, centers across the world in driving 
uh, a livable, sustainable, inclusive and resilient uh, economy for Londoners. And I think if you do that, uh, the rest will fall into place. Wonderful. Jamie. Um, so I would I would sort of uh, be campaigning on a continued push to more active transport. So and I think the, the mayor's done a made a great set of initial steps there. I think there's further we could go. Uh, the other thing I would be doing is really urging to double down on EV charging infrastructure. So I think looking to places like Netherlands and the right to charge as really integral ways of setting the policy framework that encourages private sectors to, to invest. Fantastic, in a nutshell. Well, that's 11.30 on the dot. And I think that is the time when we uh, have to bring proceedings uh, to a close. So I'd just like to thank uh, Jamie and Dimitri for your uh, terrific insights. Uh, and also uh, in absentia, Catherine as well. It's been a fascinating conversation. These are really thorny and difficult questions, uh, but certainly from where I'm sitting, um, we have no choice but to use this, uh, the terrible circumstances in which we find ourselves as, as a platform for uh, a green recovery, because there will be no second chances uh, when it comes to the climate and ecological emergencies. Um, so thank you for your contributions this morning. You'd both have my vote if you uh, decided to uh, stand for uh, election in next year's mayor elections. There is still time. I'm sure Centre for London would have your 10,000 pounds. <laughs> well, you know, why couldn't it be a job share? Um, <laughs> but thank you again. And, uh, and thank you to the, the audience for your participation, for your questions. I'm terribly sorry I couldn't get the, all the questions in. I did try to um, uh, composite them and to use the old trade unions language as best I, I can. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more opportunities to discuss the points you make in the future. And back to you, Kate. Thank you so much, all of you. And thank you, uh, everybody watching and listening for being here this morning. Uh, thanks also to our sponsors of London Conference 2020, the Corporation of the City of London, LNQ, Uber, uh, supporting sponsors London Councils, the London Legacy Development Corporation, London Property Alliance, the Greater London Authority, Primera and Trust for London, and exhibiting sponsors, Commonplace and Port of London Authority. Uh, as we may have mentioned, uh, climate change and how London recovers from coronavirus are both major themes in our big London Futures project. You can find out more about that at centerforlondon.org. And we'll be starting up a networking session so people can continue the discussion, maybe talk about some of those questions that we haven't had the chance to fully explore. That'll start right after I'm done speaking. And the link and password is in the joining email that you have this morning. So. We'll see you there. And the next session today is also on economic recovery, uh, looking at how new working patterns and travel patterns are going to affect local economies all across the city. Uh, and that features Paul Scully, who's the Minister for London, uh, Claire Coghill from Waltham Forest, who's also the Executive Member for Skills and Employment at London Councils, uh, Vidya Alexson from Power to Change, Paul Williams from Derwent, and it will be chaired by our own uh, research director, Claire Harding. So that starts at 2 p.m. sharp, and we're looking forward to it. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you.